Hello, and welcome to Exploring Axon, a podcast where we discuss Axon Framework, Axon Server, and their ecosystem. I am your host and a software developer at Axonic, Sarah Tori. In this episode, I spoke with my colleague, Nick Flurry. Nick is one of our field operations specialists who works closely with various Axon Framework and Axon Server users. He explained his process of sharing knowledge and information about architectural concepts such as DDD, CQRS, event-driven architecture, and more with various users and companies. He also talked about the onboarding process for Axon customers and prospects. He shared some really interesting and great use cases for Axon Framework and Axon Server that he's been involved in. And lastly, we talked about working remotely, about conferences, and much more. I really hope you enjoy my conversation with Nick, and let's have a listen. Hi, Nick. How are you today? I am doing fantastic, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you you so much for joining me. I am so excited to talk to you about some really cool stuff and um, some things that I haven't talked about before in uh, in this podcast. So really, really looking forward to the conversation. So thank you so much for joining me and sharing your experience and your knowledge with all of us. Really appreciate it. So before we delve into some of these uh, really amazing topics that I can't wait to hear about. Uh, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and where you're located at? Certainly, certainly. So uh, thanks for having me again too, Sarah. And um, oh, my I pleasure. Am, yeah, yeah. I'm actually located in Atlanta, Georgia, the United States. Uh, everyone says Atlanta, actually about 30 minutes north, 45 minutes north of the city in a little town called Sugar Hill, living the sweet life. And uh, what I do for Axonic is mainly field ops is what I like to call it, or helping our customers, open source users, uh, technically validate with uh, all things Axonic uh, with both the open source tech and our enterprise solutions, and especially the uh, design patterns that we advocate for. So DDD, CQRS, event sourcing, and all things event-driven architectures or really microservices where I see a lot of folks moving towards. Um, but been in the, uh, I'll say, big data space and open source world for about seven years. Before that, I did about five years in uh, the healthcare space at a little teeny tiny company called McKesson. <laughs> so about four or five years at the world's biggest uh, healthcare organization there before they got out of the real health IT and focused more on delivering COVID vaccines and do what they're good at with the distribution channels of all things, right. uh, you know, medical distribution. But that's my background. And um you know, just been at Axonic for about eight months now, so I know everything, <laughs> almost. <laughs> uh, but no, learning a ton from you, Sarah, uh, you know, smart folks over in, in the Netherlands. So thanks again for uh, you know bringing me into this. This is exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really glad to have you. It's been a wonderful um uh, addition to to the whole team having you and uh, it's you and I were having a conversation a couple of weeks ago and it's just so amazing and fascinating how quickly you've um, learned all of these different concepts and uh, different aspects of um, Axon and its products and speaking of that so you mentioned a little bit about the design patterns and uh, the the fact that you uh, do work with a lot of customers and are in direct contact with uh, a lot of folks not just the enterprise customers, but also folks who are using the open source products that we have. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. So how do you kind of go about that? How, um, I know a lot of uh, people who are a little bit more new to the concepts of uh, DDD or event-driven architecture or message-driven architecture um, sometimes have a bit of a hard time sort of getting used to these different aspects and things like that. So how do you uh, facilitate uh, the transition or sort of kind of, um, uh, if you would, change their minds about uh, maybe some of the older ways of doing things and bringing them into a little bit more uh, new and improved ways of designing their systems. Certainly. So there's, um, I'd say, kind of two paths that I've engaged with uh, the community members who are typically folks who are looking at uh, these design patterns already. And then there's a separate bucket of folks who uh, may not be as familiar, maybe they'd heard of it, but never really uh, dabbled or, or kicked over any anthills with DDD or CQRS. Um, and the neat thing is, especially with say DDD, the domain driven design uh, pattern, uh, is it's you know, not really new. It's been around for, I guess, 20 plus years. And uh, you know, when I got here, I wanted to jump in the deep end and 
what I've done in different worlds, the Hadoop space or time series world with things like Influx or Grafana, Prometheus is just start to make my own, uh, you know, curriculum, if you will, on different Wikipedia wormhole pages and YouTube yeah. videos and blogs. But that that EDD world, I guess, uh, I read a lot of um, like Lickies from Martin Fowler or looked at the Blue Book a little bit from Eric Evans. And right. uh, there's another, you know, the Red Book from Von Vernon and all these different sort of thought processes. But uh, with DDD specifically, um, if they're someone who's done domain-driven design, I usually give that like a two thumbs up and we can more quickly uh, roll into like a CQRS, the command query responsibility separation dialogues and conversations. They may have, uh, you know, used DDD to grease the wheels into CQRS. And then what I've then seen is graduating into event sourcing. So when you think CQRS being maybe 10, 11 years old, event sourcing coming shortly after that, they all marry up pretty nicely. And those conversations with folks who are familiar uh, with those design patterns, um, tend to uh, get what Axonic is, is putting out there in the open source world. And then when they need to scale their use cases, uh, looking at some of the enterprise illities of what we deliver mm -hmm. around security, scalability, maintainability, manageability. So uh, love having those conversations, but I also love having the other bucket where folks are not familiar uh, with DDD, CQR. Absolutely. Yeah, it gives yeah. us an opportunity to educate uh, you know, advocate for those design patterns and then um, really sort of help folks stay on track. And one customer I spoke with that I loved the feedback they provided um, with our Axon framework, open source Axon framework, was it is just a beautiful tool for staying on track or staying on rails. So you think like Ruby on rails or Grails for Groovy, it's like here's Axon framework and it keeps us for any, you know, JVM language you know, whether it's Java, Kotlin, Groovy, Scala, Clojure, it's like, okay, we have this framework that just keeps us on track and we can smooth sail and not get off, go down any rabbit holes and design this, uh, you know, focused on the business logic and with these design pattern principles in place. And then um, the other neat thing that I've seen a lot of good feedback on in addition to it being on Rails, uh, again, going back to the first bucket of folks who are familiar is that uh, they're going to be able to... Uh, you know, then use uh, this to build a more scalable and easier to change app and moving away from some of these, say, more traditional or I'll call them legacy, or I like to say now say vintage application design, if it was sort of the... I like that. Yeah, it's really yeah. vintage. I don't want to call anyone's baby ugly. So, right. you know, they may hate their baby, sadly. Uh, <laughs> they can't, you can't change things. Like they want to change the, the front door of the application, but the, the kitchen will blow up and explode. Yeah. So, um, you know, they look at this cruddy app or this cruddy monolith, you know, create, read, update design or kind of mm -hmm. read to your architecture. And they're like, we need to do something to be able to change and not have, say, comp competition just blow by us. And, and we've seen this a lot, folks moving more towards the event driven architectures uh, and even taking a, a you know, three tier crud based type monolith and then making that first more event driven. And then when they're ready and ready to kind of graduate into the microservices world, it just, again, greases the wheels to going into that, uh, you know, kind of microservices, Kubernetes type environments with the Axon framework there. And I know what I was going to bring up now earlier was these customers I've worked with that specifically say use Java and Spring Boot or the Spring <laughs> framework. We don't, you know, as a open source company don't care if you're using Spring or Quarkus or Micronaut or, or Vertex. We'll sit in any of those or outside of those. So um, uh, it's akin to, I guess, what Spring, uh, our Spring Source, the company did for Spring back in the early 2000s, which the founders here at Axonic had a, a great hand in of spreading yeah. seeds with Trifork and spring across the globe. So yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, it's awesome to work with those great minds here and then have a tool like Axon Framework that can sit beautifully in Spring Boot or any other kind of tools for spinning up applications or standalone, so. Yeah, absolutely. So really, really neat conversations I'm sure you have with uh, with various folks and uh, that are coming to kind of explore these different patterns and uh, technologies. So when you come across um, a, a company or a team that's interested in, uh, for instance, using Axon Framework, um, or maybe they're using Axon Framework, but they are kind of ready to try Axon Server. Um, what is sort of the onboarding process like? Yeah, so for open source Axon Server as well, um, something that 
we will typically see folks dip their toe in the water with a uh, axonic. A lot of times we'll do complimentary trainings around axon server. And of course we will uh, also throw in say a two week free trial license to the enterprise solutions. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that for the clustering and uh, scale <laughs> some, uh, yeah. some security in there too with the axon data protection module, but mm -hmm. the kind of learning curve I've seen relatively quick, actually, I think it's uh, akin to our, Awesome trainers, uh, you know, working with uh, Christian Vermorkin out of Mexico City, yeah. also a Dutch guy in Mexico City now. Um, just get rave feedback on him and VJ out in California who wrote a book on Axon Framework. Uh, yeah. Uh, I see the Axon server adoption really ramping up and just lifting a heavy weight off of folks' shoulders, a lot of developers' shoulders who have had to go build or piecemeal together some Kafka event streaming solution with a, a Postgres or a Mongo DB that is their event store and trying to handle the message routing too. So when they can go from Axon Framework and then marry that up with a Axon server, which in that case would be zero config for all things storage of those events, as well as routing them for your yeah. commands, queries, and the, the glue between those, the events, it's like, this yeah. is just, you know, a no brainer. Uh, and it's usually a fast, I feel like onboarding, maybe mm -hmm. a week or two weeks of guidance from Axonic, you know, nice. a week of training, two weeks of training. And then um, uh, from there, you're going to train the trainer approach and then they're off and running. And with our, say, community, uh, discuss.axonic community, it's been huge to continue to provide guidance. But then when you're a more formal relationship with Axonic, you, you know, get that Slack channel or another medium of your choosing to, uh, you know, pose questions and then the ticketing system. Regularly communicate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the trainings because, um, there are a lot of trainings that we do offer even for Axon Framework itself and um, even for some of these patterns that uh, you just mentioned a little bit earlier, DDD, uh, CQRS and all of that. Uh, we do offer um, these trainings so that folks can become more familiar and um, if they want more assistance or are interested in uh, more things, of course, um, other things like this podcast or blogs yeah. or yeah, reference guide and things like that, they're just all available. You did maybe... I recall an Axonic Academy podcast, or have we not done that yet? We no, do we haven't done that. Yes, that's a we great suggestion. <laughs> we should do that. It's still in the process because I know that um, they're still uh, finishing up their last course. So it's it's mm -hmm. been in the talks, but I'm definitely yeah. looking forward to um, that being um, done in a, in a more kind of done stage. But it is available, absolutely, and, and it's free for um, anybody who wants to use it and has some really great videos as well as written documentation for and folks you get to a, learn about Axon. A shiny, uh, nice shiny certificate that says you're an expert in DDD. <laughs> I know. And that yeah. one is exciting because I've done the courses and when you see that, you're like, ooh, cool. Right. I accomplished something really cool. That's, that's really nice. So aside from um, these really cool places to learn and uh, explore, I'm also really interested to hear about some of the use cases that you've come across with, um, you know, mm -hmm. folks, whether it's been just the open source usage or even in the enterprise edition for Axon Server. So, yeah. Do you have some cool stories to share? Absolutely. I'm sure so, you do. <laughs> yeah. Love to, love to. And I'll do my best to keep the names anonymous of some of the accounts and of course yeah you'll have to edit it out if i slip up <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll do okay <laughs> yeah, some yeah. folks we have ndas with and uh, others folks i'm in the process of seeing if we can go to market with some customer success stories and some uh, excellent yeah some good you know new podcast material for you as well as uh, blog material nice. uh, but i guess i'll start kind of small to big and, and share two or three stories but thinking about some of the startups, the the neat thing about working with startups is a lot of times they do not have the um, uh, weight of an old legacy app that they have to then go and deconstruct and try and make it more, say, event driven in this case. So they can kind of hit the ground running. And many folks um, had used, say, Axon Framework because that is a tool that's been around for 10, 12 years. Uh, yeah. Our co-founder, Allard, created that. And kind of let it do its thing out in the open source world. And when he saw five, six million open source downloads, he goes, oh, maybe we should build a company. Maybe there's something good happening here. <laughs> exactly. So a lot of those folks who have been familiar with Axon Framework and decided to bring this into their small to medium business or startup and make some new cutting edge um, tool. Uh, the first one that comes to mind that I just think is an awesome use case 
And when you think about uh, like the Uber Eats of today's world or um, you know, Amazon Prime or Instacart, things delivered to your house and getting to track things on your say, smartphone and, and tablet and see where they are on the map. So there's a, a new service out there. I don't know if there's any other companies doing this yet, but I'm sure they will follow um, around like a white glove uh, car maintenance service. So they come to work on your vehicle at your home and can do X, Y, and Z services. And you go on your app and you have them, uh, you know, I guess, spit out sort of a projected cost and say, yes, you know, book that appointment or come do my oil change for this amount and plug, plug in your address and they come to you. So you don't, you know, working out of the house, it also is pretty convenient. Uh, for this them is to- really cool. But at the same time, it kind of makes me feel like, do I ever need to get out of the house? Because remember a couple of days ago, when we were talking with some other team members about the the dog grooming um, yes, you know, yes. businesses that come to your house. And like, all the dog grooming. Oh, just come to the house. <laughs> I just saw it the other day. Um, and, but at least this one will make it so your car works well and you can go. Exactly. <laughs> it, it provides the means for you to actually leave your house, exactly. even if you don't need to, for fun. <laughs> <laughs> really cool. Yeah, yeah. so they started uh, first building an MVP. Um, and unfortunately, before uh, the VP of architecture got over there, um, infrastructure, architecture, infrastructure, and was it engineering? I guess she uh, she got in, and there was already a MVP in place, which was the kind of standard three tier architecture, and uh, mm-hmm. it was crud crud based. But once that was built, they're going to move complete Axon framework. But in the interim, as a little POC, she took one component, was able to peel out of the um, I guess overall application, and it was for a vehicle telematics uh, type use case, and mm-hmm. uh, ingesting all the uh, event data from you know when you plug in that little device under the steering wheel and it starts to spit out data on, um, you know, if your O2 sensors in there, your spark plugs are good or what, what not is, uh, you know, acting up or, or what um, a service maybe do based on say the overall mileage. So that was the first thing she built there. Uh, and now that MVP is wrapping up, they've looped in about four or five other developers on the team. And, and we're going to start to move towards uh, breaking down that giant, monolith and and making that more event driven so they've attended a number of axon framework and axon server trainings uh really just really cool use case great group of uh, individuals to work with and um uh, looking forward to an early 2022 uh new customer there um but it's just an honor working with them uh from an open source perspective in the interim uh so that's really cool seeing some of these yeah some of these um uh, shifts from going from the monolith system or a more legacy system into um, a little bit of m- d- trying the microservices at first. And I've seen this um, or heard about many uh, customers or um, even in the previous conversations I've had with some guests of this podcast that uh, they picked one aspect of their um, application and tried it out with that and see if that really works well with their requirements and what they're trying to achieve. And um, so far, um, the cases that I've heard, they've had good success with it, where they decided to basically uh, go with the whole application and make these changes in other uh, parts of the uh, system as well, which is really, really neat process of doing it. Do it small and then see how it works, kind of trial and error, see the things that um, really turn out good, and then just continue on with the, with the rest of the system. So that's, that's really excellent. Yeah. Awesome. And then I'd say, and that that makes a lot of sense too. And I think a good bit of you know, our CTO, co-founder Allard's talks uh, do a great job of painting that picture as well. I love his you know big ball of mud, and you don't want to just start creating a distributed bunch balls of mud. <laughs> Even <just, Evenly> distributed, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so no, that's certainly uh, certainly good to point out. Um, I think like I'm trying to catch up on a, a medium, maybe size use case. Uh, so there's a, a financial services company. We see a lot, I guess this marries up beautifully with uh, kind of the FinTech space and different FinServes from uh, just really having a natural fit to do event sourcing and, and make uh, more event-driven architectures across their different services and apps. So in, in, the, in this space, we have both small, medium-sized FinTech companies that, that we work with, as well as you know, one of the 
uh, well, two of the three largest banks in the United States, one of which is pure open source, the other I work with on a very frequent, multiple times per week, having fun sessions with them right. around anti-money laundering, kind of know your customer due diligence, uh, customer due diligence uh, project and authorization type needs. But on the uh, more medium scale, there's a, a company out of New York uh, that is looking at different loan kind of application processes and, and they've moved their monolithic app to fully Axon framework and Axon server. And they were also uh, aiming to, uh, I guess, meet some compliance regulation with deleting data. So they are toying around with our Axon data protection module. Uh, and then not to be a spoiler alert, but they think the Axon data protection plugin, which is sort of behind the scenes with a few customers, like one of our health insurer customers uh, out of um, Canada, but one of the largest, I'll say, health insurers on the planet, um, looking at that data protection plugin. Uh, so that is a pretty exciting use case, I'd say, looking looking to uh, um, uh, essentially encrypt that data and then delete the token, delete the encryption key that would make the data not accessible. So yeah. meeting any sort of um, you know, policies they need there. So a lot of, in the FinServe space, I also see a lot of like um, uh, security sort of compliance regulation needs because in an event source system, you know, typically it's uh, you don't delete anything or those events are immutable. They, they happened. You can't say they didn't. And um, looking at how to delete those was has come up uh, in, in certain um, use cases. And they're like, well, we need to delete it. Yeah. So we've offered this. And then in future iterations, I guess, new versions of Axon Framework or Axon Server, I believe we'll have some new exciting info there on actually being able to delete. But our messaging up until now has always been, no, don't delete. Right. It really shouldn't, could mess up, I guess, what aggregates or projections and need to really um, you know, focus on doing this deletion, what they call, uh, what, crypto erasure, crypto shredding of- Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, deleting yeah, that. Yeah. I love that word. That's like one of my new favorite words. <laughs> Yeah, we did a podcast with uh, with Yvonne on the whole data protection module, and uh, I'm excited to see where the plugin is headed to, and uh, if we can um, possibly use it for a lot more customers or um, folks, even open source who were interested in using it. So, hundred percent, and, and that yeah. that was, I think, a really neat engagement. What I would call "quote unquote" uh, roadmap assurance, where. This customer out of Canada, a uh, very large health insurer, again, uh, across the U.S. as well. I think they're headquartered, the actual headquarters out of like Chicagoland or mm -hmm. Illinois. But they um, they are, they were really intrigued by the Axon Data Protection Module and then wanted something that was, um, I guess, not so married to the framework and more married to the server. Uh and yeah. from there, they pulled some, helped us pull something forward. Got you know in the in the weeds together and pulled that forward on our roadmap. So that's just a testament of you know, smart uh, startups. Uh, ooh, smart up! I just came up with <laughs> I like that actually better. Smart ups. <laughs> yeah, we're smart there are up. smart people in here. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, pulling that forward and just the flexibility and creativity. But when that went live and and uh, production at this healthcare um, mm -hmm. large healthcare insurance company. Uh, and we were comfortable bringing this to that other, I'll say, one of the top three largest banks in the U.S. It also helped from a legality perspective of not having to get things reviewed uh, on the legal side, which can take months right. and months and months in the financial services world. It's not as slow as government pace. Governments tend to, <laughs> my, my engagements there tend to move. But not far more. faster either. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, but not too much faster either. And this large bank has felt fallen in love with the Axon Data Protection plug in yeah. and that mm -hmm. one they can avoid more legal conversations and two the technical folks can do what they like and just be techies and jump right in and it i guess sits and plugs into axon server so it's um exactly. uh just easier for them to use and and uh yeah much more hippo compliant and gdpr yes. yeah yeah exactly exactly so it's yeah. a lot safer to use nice okay yeah lots of uh, really fascinating uh, use cases and also um, smart ways of doing things that are that's always yeah. always yeah. really well, cool we're, to hear about. We're a smart up, so of course we have smart ways of doing <laughs> things. <laughs> but there's we one. Do have, yeah. If I have time, do I have time to tell my favorite of one? Of course, yes, please do. Okay, there's so always time one, for favorites. Yeah, this one's a testament of just the sheer capability, performance capability of 
uh, Axon server. Um, yeah. And essentially the, the enterprise version of that, when you go to clustering and wanting to have multiple uh, contact, multi-contact support or multiple bounded contacts there. And um, what this company done is actually manufacturing the largest automotive manufacturing company in the U.S. and uh, really exciting use case. And this is one piece of, you know, many different business units and divisions, but it's a, I guess I can say, you know, kind of materials planning and logistics is sort of the business unit they're in, but it's a use case called Global Track and Trace, and then they've codenamed it Control Tower. So oh, I've heard about this. this is so cool. I'm so glad you're talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so not to be confused with Yvonne, who you had on for the data protection module, uh, but Yvonne, IVAN, works very closely yeah. with this customer. And working to see if they'd be interested in doing a podcast with you, Sarah, at some point and go to market with a success story because they've brought us into other divisions now at their organization. And they've just um, actually, st well, they started with a three node cluster of Axon Server Enterprise Edition, you know, so I had three nodes in like test and dev. Um, and what they were able to accomplish with our, I'll say basic or standard kind of entry level, when you think about high availability, having three nodes, so you have some failover, uh, was actually capturing 700 uh, gigabytes of event data, uh, so wow. both uh, approaching the terabyte, and um, uh, this is, I want to say, 200 plus, or no, it was, um, there's going to be another 200,000 vehicles coming online when they open up the floodgates to South America, and then Europe, and uh, Africa, and uh, Middle East, so they're looking at, at that, which is why they just added on additional, a couple of additional nodes just recently. Uh, but what they're essentially doing is taking all the event data as soon as the vehicle is completed in the factory and tracking and tracing this with all the steps because you got to think there's you know hundreds or thousands of different carriers that they use to make sure the vehicle gets to the end destination, mm -hmm. which would be the dealership. Uh, so when this vehicle is completed in the factory, you know they can say, okay, check. We can send it out, and the factory gets paid. And then the credit team gets paid when the vehicle actually gets delivered to the dealership. And the dealership is excited to get it because then they can sell you and, and me a car and a nice shiny warranty or insurance policy and everyone's getting paid. Everyone's super happy. But what was, yeah, what was happening was vehicles were going missing or they were delayed. And, you know, the ETA, they couldn't really uh, give appropriately to you know, where it was supposed to land or different carriers when it goes from you know, a, a truck to a plane, to a boat, to a train, to wherever it needs to go to get to its, you know, final landing spot. And so by taking the old school uh, global track and trace tools and uh, which I guess were more monolithic in nature and depended a lot on third party, um, other third party vendors that were sort of piecemealed together was they moved towards a, a more microservices approach, which I, I hope I, I think I can share that they were um, they chose, I guess, OpenShift and that sort of Kubernetes sort of uh, tool there uh, right. on Pivotal Cloud Foundry uh, and married that up with Axon Framework and Axon Server Enterprise Edition to be able to have Kafka dump in. So you know, this is where Kafka is a beautiful use case to have it dump in a stream of events, but then going back and actually be able to time travel on those VIN numbers of these vehicles when they hit you know, point A or point A.1 or A.2 or A.3 before it finally gets to the next, say, phase and, and being able to say, oh, this vehicle went missing. It might be on the black market now getting chopped up, sold to all different parts of <laughs> the, the, the yeah. globes. So, um, the visibility they were able to capture there and the scalability was just leaps and bounds over what they were able to do prior and the mm -hmm. sort of, um, uh, what would I say, roadblock, quote unquote, roadblocks for this vehicle automotive company that they were yeah. facing and uh, different bottlenecks they were facing with the different third party vendors that they had to sort of piecemeal together. So when they brought this solution more in-house and were able to do it with a value added partner like Axon, and and I believe this was pre, uh, pre COVID too. So, you know, our co-founder Oliver spent maybe several weeks or months on, I think Yvonne spent several months uh, on site there too. And yeah. um just really exciting group of folks to work with, and they've introduced us to their larger enterprise architecture uh, dev enablement uh, group. So uh, we will be looking at other use cases, and even go back as far as old mainframes here, and see how we can start to move them towards more event-driven monoliths or more yeah. uh, driven microservices. So really exciting, really really fascinating things, and uh, definitely it's on my radar to uh, to. Uh 
record an episode with them. They've been so hard at work getting uh, from the three node cluster onto the five node cluster in the past couple of months that, um, yeah, it's, and we hear some updates about it. And it's always really, really exciting to, to hear yeah. these new things and, and the Yvonne, technology that you're using. Yeah. Yeah. Yvonne Dugalik and uh, Sarah Pellegrini, I think have just, yeah. been, I'm sure others have been involved. So just uh, can't hear enough good things from customers talking about our, you know, boots on the ground, Axon, mm -hmm. um, uh, Exonic uh, support engineers and um, just great, great team here. So I, I feel yeah, honored yeah. To, to be on it. <laughs> I snuck and through somehow. <laughs> and of course, they're in, in, in fabulous hands, both with Yvonne. Yvonne's been working with them for uh, quite some time. And yeah. Sarah mm -hmm. is uh, one of the lead developers of Axon Server. So she's um, extremely just knowledgeable, super cool, smart lady. I just, uh, yeah, I just love her and she's wonderful to, um, just be there with them because it's, you know, she, she has the in-depth knowledge of the, the product itself. And so that's, that's a really cool, um, case that I'll come back to and to kind of, uh, de uh dive deeper into the, yeah, spe specifics of that, but yeah. Do, just to change that yeah, could a whole podcast on its own because it has exactly. the, the control tower has the, you know, the, what is it? The route planner, the milestone executor, the order piece. It's got yeah. uh, just so many components to it. And, you know, again, Yvonne has been phenomenal there with the, I, I think there's a podcast on this and I've shared uh, the other Yvonne's podcast around the data protection module. Yeah. But Yvonne Dukalik, uh, he's, uh, he's done the great things in the event modeling space and sharing mm -hmm. some this has been is huge. Yeah, too. he and I have partnered up quite a few times in uh, event modeling and sort of modeling for um, various uh, occasions, whether it's um, we're coming up with hopefully a webinar in the beginning of next year, hopefully talking more about um, modeling applications and things like that. So very, very knowledgeable architect and just a fabulous person to, to work with. So definitely. Mm -hmm. So just to change gears a little bit, okay. I know that recently you <laughs> went out of your house, <laughs> maybe with the help of this wonderful company who came to fix, hopefully you didn't need to fix your car, but anyways, joking <laughs> aside, um, you did travel just recently and uh, did a conference. Um, so how was that? How, it was an in-person conference. It was the first in, I think, a long time. Yeah. At least so how was that? That was phenomenal. Um we went to I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. We went to the Kansas City Developer Conference and mm -hmm. uh, just really great turnout. I think there were maybe expected to be 2,000 people there. They maybe ended up with around 12 to 1,500 and a ton of booth traffic. And unfortunately, yeah. uh, VJ Nair, who uh, had unfortunately came down with COVID, so he was unable to go. And I had to then yeah. put on my technical hat and uh, um, I did a fabulous know. job at <laughs> <laughs> presenting everything yeah which is awesome it was a blast so many different conversations uh with with a lot of smaller companies but also some of the the bigger names over there too um and really the 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 booth traffic was just like a breath of fresh air because you had shaken hands and of course you know we all had our masks on and uh which is totally fine and, and making sure you know you keep each other safe and i don't i didn't really hear any horror stories of people getting sick or leaving um going back home but um just the overall event was done really well. Great yeah. swag uh, and, and a lot of good conversations. And also some folks who use Axon Open Source came by the booth and said, oh, we, we love what you're doing there. Um, cool. almost, you know, there there is a you know, job is everywhere in the world. A lot of folks were using JVM on some teams, but also in the Midwest, I, I do hear from time to time that it's a, I guess, a, a bigger dot net um, uh, sort of spot in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so from an Axon framework perspective, a lot of conversations were like, that's super cool. Could you all still help us with, uh, you know, say DDD or CQRS um, uh, planning and kind of the, the principles that are within those design patterns? We're like, yeah, we can actually give pointers and provide guidance. The framework may not be the best fit, um, you know, right now from a JVM perspective, but Axon server, we transitioned a lot of those conversations to, uh, you know, where we're at and how we've had other customers say on JavaScript, a uh, big a customer out of New Zealand actually built a connector uh, to connect their JavaScript, I guess, application, and then have the events ingested into Axon server, Axon server enterprise there. And because we do realize that not everyone's a, a, a say, JVM shop and, right. you know, don't want to go again, calling people's babies ugly. It's like, all right. <laughs> 
there are plenty of other great apps built on so many other different languages. So yeah. that is, I've heard internally here at Axonic, kind of the big three we'll be looking at will be things like .NET, JavaScript, and um, uh, Python from a connector mm -hmm. standpoint. So it can be more of that zero config into uh, Axon Server. From Axon server. Yeah, and that's the beauty of Axon Server because it's really language agnostic and um, you can still use it if you're, mm -hmm. um, if you're not using Axon Framework, which is really 100%. cool. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you have been working with Axonic and uh, remotely, just like me. And... <laughs> <laughs> and you have worked remotely with other um, with other companies as well. And uh, yeah, how, how's your experience been with that? Especially, I know you have a little one. Um, yeah. If I can share, you're expecting another little one, and so you're busy, busy bee. The uh, new top, the new baby bed right there. I was supposed to build the crib this past weekend, but we decided to go to the Atlanta, uh, zoo Atlanta instead. Yeah. Zoo uh, always wins. Yeah, zoo is <laughs> zoo trumps any uh, housework for sure. But I think I showed you. I built the uh, the uh, closet the other week, so that was good. Um, That's really cool. Another, another peek. Hopefully, I don't unplug any cords. Oh yeah, uh, nice. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Saw, uh, Looking good. Removing the doors and building uh, you know, more open open space, which I'm all for too. And um, it's been a little bit of an adjustment. Uh, mm -hmm. From the travel perspective, like you said, Kansas City mm -hmm. Dev Conference was the first one in a minute that got out of the house for, but I've been working remotely now for about seven years, even at the end of my time with McKesson, you know, a giant corporation that had offices everywhere. I was going in, but towards the end there, I um, was given a little bit more leash and runway to, to go out and you know, work out of the house. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's nice because you meet so many people from all across the globe now. Absolutely, yeah. Especially in the startup world, really interesting people, very talented, and you're not, uh, you know, pigeonholed into picking folks, you know, just in say the Atlanta area here, and you can go out and get folks that are, you know, experts in their domains and and really have done just phenomenal things, and and you're not like. I guess, limited in that sense. Exactly. So I've really enjoyed working remotely because I meet these interesting people and uh, make new relationships. And then when travel does open up and I'm like, oh, I got a friend, Corrado, who lives outside of Milan and I can ask him about this. And, oh, what do you know? He's a, he just happens to be a Braves fan, Atlanta Braves fan too. So it's like, <laughs> so I oh, you, a you too. Oh, you too. <laughs> you a Braves jersey, Sarah. <laughs> I'm um, going to put my Astros jersey on. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is sad though because it just kind of pointed me towards when i went to this kcdc conference it was like wow it's so good to get in front of someone shake a hand go out have a drink and play some games at the uh you know social events at night and uh you know standing up and actually uh because again vj wasn't there being able to deliver a technical talk and have yeah. all it beamed in from you know thousands of miles away or kilometers away <laughs> and from the netherlands exactly. and, and helping to give that CPRS talk, it was like really neat to just have that in-person dynamic yeah. again. And, and so I do miss that and that part is sad, but it, it's hard to, once you start working out of the house, I feel like it's hard to give up those freedoms of, oh, I wanna go downstairs and grab a snack or there's something mm -hmm. else I can get. And um, I think it actually does make at least me more productive. Some people need the in-office space. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times folks would come by and start small chat. And I'm a social guy. You know, I love to have a small chat with them before I know it. It's like, oh, I didn't send that email. I didn't you know, follow up with this, this customer right. or I had to do this internal thing. So. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity that, uh, you know, the one silver lining of this whole unfortunate um, COVID that uh, has happened, it's kind of made it a little bit more possible for folks who are unable to, uh, travel and work from uh, a, an office space to be able to work from their homes and still uh, do what they love to do and um, advance their careers and uh, raise their children, especially as parents. It's mm -hmm. sometimes hard to to have that travel time or if you're living in a city like Houston where it's very traffic prone, it's it sometimes takes a really long time. I used to work um outside of home several years ago and from my house to the office it was about 13 miles and uh, many days it would take me an hour and a half to make either trip to the office or back home so mm -hmm. it's really nice to have that but at the same time 
Uh, I do miss that sort of uh, social interaction and seeing other people. I feel mm. like in, in a lot of ways I've become antisocial where I wasn't at all. I was very much a social person. And um, this time that I've been with Axonic, it's been 100% remote and I still haven't had the opportunity to ma- meet anybody in person in the company, which I always joke with all art. And I'm like, nobody in the company has like legs because I only see people from torso <laughs> up. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to being able to, you know, have those options to travel and see folks in person. I think it's um, that's something that we're missing. I'm missing a lot, actually. But so Atlanta's yeah. a very, it's a, you know, a hub city. Everyone can get to Atlanta, you know, usually directly or yeah. at, to direct anywhere else. And I've been pushing pretty hard for a fun uh, Java kind of focused conference or JVM conference focused and spring focused conference called dev nexus going to be like mm-hmm. april supposed to be in person so maybe put hey. it on the calendar uh, yeah for fun. everybody come meet us there <laughs> if we can make it yeah i know right um i know as you know my boss has been phenomenal and before i yeah. got here he was managing you know all field operations uh globally yeah. and customers just love him too because of his creativity and, and flexibility with certain engagements but mm-hmm. really just the feedback uh, was a huge thing for why I joined here on, oh, this, at, when, when I joined, I think I was higher number 35, 36, and Jeanneau was mm-hmm. telling me, you know, trying to really scale this company, have, you know, approaching, I guess, over 50, now approaching 100 customers, which is awesome. And I was at a, a previous startup, which not not everyone can be winners. <laughs> so I've <been laughs> some, real, some real stinkers. Uh, so I, uh, I think this was maybe my fourth or fifth. And uh, uh, the one before was... Um, it was fine. Cool technology, open source out of uh, Netflix called Spinnaker for continuous mm-hmm. delivery and mm-hmm. cool tech, you know, had a few new customers sign up and real cool use cases, but you know, we had over a hundred employees and you know, less than 10 customers. So it was sort of like, Oh, and here I'm talking with, you my boss now. And, and his name is actually, you boss, which I love. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the boss. yeah, they're doing something right. Customers love them. Open source communities, vibrant, fun group of people. So when you have, you know, a remote team, but still they're able to engage this well. The culture here has been exactly. beautiful because you get you know, your little welcome package. And I, I don't have my coffee mug today, but I got the shiny lucky shirt on. Exactly. And, um, you know, the different Slack channels, it's fun to take virtual coffee breaks with folks or just yeah. you know, catching up like frequently with Corrado or even we're still small enough where Yarun, our CEO, will will throw something on my calendar once a quarter and you know, catch up with him. So it's exactly. really nice. And of course, Allard's phenomenal to always speak with. The uh, yeah. customers are in love with Allard. I think they put him up here on this pedestal, which <laughs> I, I put him. He's like a celebrity. So Exactly right. <laughs> So anyways, yeah, so now that we've concluded our commercial and advertisement of Axon, no, just kidding. <laughs> it is, it's, it is a, one of the uh, best environments I've worked with and I've worked in different sectors and it's, it's really enjoyable to work with so many really talented folks and uh, just open-minded and happy to help and things like that. And uh, it's been really fun, but I really want to thank you, Nick, for uh, making the time to share some of your uh, background and also experiences within Axonic and outside of Axonic with me today. I I know you have a very busy calendar. So thank you for being here. As always, it's really, really fun to chat with you and good luck with everything. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And I look forward to catching up again soon. um, Absolutely. And just honored to be here on the team. So look forward to what's to come. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. Have a good one. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to my talk with Nick. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please join me next time as I talk about other really fascinating topics. Until then, have a great time and happy coding.